trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Before we go any further, here's a quick message from our sponsor for this episode, Remote. Remote empowers companies of all sizes to pay and manage full-time and contract workers around the world. We take care of international payroll, benefits, taxes, stock options, and compliance in dozens of countries. Our people are on the ground on every continent building culturally aware employment packages that help you build trust with your global team. Our ironclad intellectual property protections and industry-leading security guarantee give you peace of mind across the globe. Best of all, Remote never charges percentages or fees. One low flat rate helps you control your budget so you can focus on growing your business. Thanks. Let's go to the episode. Hello, hello, listeners and viewers. Welcome to the Soaked by Slash podcast. My name is Ilian van der Palen and Lisa Krautio is I'm next here. to me. I'm trying We're not to lean against the wall here. Yeah, and trying not to freeze uh, yes. in the in the space. In this little box. We are at Slash 2021 and we've been joined by Jeannie and Eki Newton. Welcome. Hey, thanks Hi. for having us. How's it going? Super Welcome. great to have you. We just listened to your talk and, and um, super fun to have you on the on the show as well. So do you want to start off by a short introduction of yourselves and, and your company? Yes. Yeah, so um, Eki and I founded a company called Karma Cans and Karma Kitchen. Um, Karma Cans was our first business, which was founded in 2014. It's a corporate catering business. Um, had a bit of a rocky year, but it's it's getting back on track. Um, we do like food for tech businesses, basically. And uh, one of our biggest issues was finding kitchen space. So that led us to Karma Kitchen, which is a solution for food businesses. We build co-working kitchens uh, for people in the whole food sector, from delivery to production to drinks, everything. Everything. Um, so Karma Kitchen is a dark kitchen provider. We take industrial warehouses. Um, we buy them um, and sometimes lease them too. Um, and then we basically fit them out as kitchen units. So we split them into individual units of different sizes, fit them out with all the equipment which we maintain and run. And we um, then lease that those units up to businesses of all different sizes so just like Jeannie said we serve the whole food market everything from like tiny startups at concept stage all the way through to massive multinationals basically and we have uh, three open sites two opening um, early next year and then we're opening we just bought another like we would tell you who the multinationals are, but I've been telling everyone, and then I had an NDA email today, and I was like, oh, no, it's too late. I've oh, told loads of people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think, How do I retract? Did, do you think that they sent the NDA? I'm because I'm talking about it too much. Because you're talking about it too much. I actually just knew. Yeah, what do you have, you have to do about? if you... Like, what's <laughs> yeah. the penalty? I know. Like, I don't really get NDA. Sometimes I'm like, really? But um, I didn't mention it on stage today because I had that NDA email, so yeah. it was a good reminder. Well, that's not good because millions of people listen to this podcast. Like, tens of millions. Okay, so it's top secret. <laughs> yeah. And what what's your background? Did you have a background in the food industry before you yeah. started or? So we basically both went into this. I was 21 when we started yeah. um, Karma Cans. Eki was a chef back in the day. I was, I a, was a kitchen porter. But so. I mean, basically, this was our first job out of university, the Karma Cans job, like a proper, proper job. Um, I was doing an MSc in basically terrorism and conflict studies at LSE. Not that linked to food. Not no. linked to food. And in fact, many of my... My my, co- my my peers, yeah. not colleagues, um, you know, now they like can't really talk about their jobs because they're all doing kind of secret service stuff, I think. And I'm the only person like, come on, like, tell us about what you're doing. And I'm like, that could have been you in the secret service. So Eki's not very me. good at secrets, so maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's apparently some uh, British secret service people. I don't know if it's called yeah, secret service. Yeah, like some MI6 people later. here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eki was at school with them, so she would be able to point them out. Okay. okay. They're <laughs> not that sneaky. You can yeah. just point well, them out. Well, I'm definitely the least le- sneaky. I'm out just, of them. Yeah, I'm very... Uh, do they wear a black suit with like a hoodie? Like, yeah, it's just, like, just, James, just Bond. Bond. Yeah. James Bond. Just James Bond. Okay. James yeah. Bond. So we really, we really, we uh, really, yeah, fell into this and then started cooking and growing it from that point. Mm. I was going to say something that was completely unrelated to our company, but related to James Bond. You can do that. I'll skip it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I saw James. I saw. I saw. I saw James Bond in another film, and he had an American accent. I mean, oh, I saw that one too. It was really strange. Yeah, the one with the murder mystery. The, in the one house, with right? the murder mystery yeah. in the house. Oh, and Knives was, Out. Yeah, 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 yeah Knives yeah, Out. Yeah. It's uh, the guy who's James Bond, and I was like, 
why does he have an American accent? Yeah, in a very, very American accent. Very American quite well, accent. I have to say. Once it was, you get over the shock, it's kind of amusing. In no, a way. I loved it. I just yeah. didn't get why James Bond was suddenly American. <laughs> and then everybody pointed out that he was an actor and that I had to accept that he would move on to new roles. So. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they really do. What's it like working together as no. sisters? Yeah, I mean... It's amazing. It's probably one of the best things. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't amazing. It was really hard. We are very different people, and we think in totally different ways. I think that's why we've done well together. But at the beginning, we weren't sure what our roles were. You know, I obviously now I'm kind of leading the commercial and sales and Eki's strategy. But at the beginning, we were both cooking in a kitchen and cycling together. And Eki is the, the trained, more trained chef. So she had strong opinions about the way the food should be and I did too so we used to fight I loads. genuinely I think it's been an amazing working relationship and yeah. I you know you're like my best friend obviously yes. um, I and I think you know we just get on we get on so well we spend all of our time together it's a real pleasure to spend time together and but we don't you know pull any punches I think when you're working with a friend or with a colleague it can be difficult to resolve conflict or when you experience conflict the tendency can be to shy away from it. And um, when you're a sibling, you're obviously very used to resolving conflicts mm -hmm. with your siblings. So and engaging it comes, it. Yeah, engaging with it, and it comes naturally. And you get, you know, I think it is important to have that, um, you know, people say, do you fight? And yes, we do fight, but we also are really good at, like, resolving and yeah. making up and also collaborating on decision-making where both of us disagree with each other and then moving forward from that point mm -hmm. through maybe disagreeing or, like, trying to persuade the other person. You find that the first idea you had is often not the idea that you end up with at the end of it, you know, after the, after the debate. Mm -hmm. And it's funny when we work with people who are not... Um, who maybe are not siblings, but... Um, Friends also but, in business. Or, or just, you know, sometimes when you, you, some people that come into the company are quite used to making independent decisions without informing or consulting with other people in their team. You know, maybe they've worked in a team previously where they can just go ahead and make a decision and then that's, that's that. Our team is very collaborative. Everybody does a lot of like listening and debating and really like our role is not to like shut down the listening debate but to encourage it and then at a certain point say okay right decisions made now we have to execute on that and you know our role is to like hold people to the execution plan rather than hold people to like the same kind of idea and not to disagree because that's when you get the best outcomes was when everybody thinks differently and everyone's super diverse in their thought processes and is heard in a meaningful way and you can like kind of fight through it and then execute yeah basically yeah yeah usually you need a disagreement to see the question on a different level to sort of syn synthesize the two theses in a nice yeah, way we really do approach everything in a very different way I, so. I, I, I was reading i was reading uh, thinking fast and slow again the other day and um and he said something really interesting. He was like, people don't feel any subjective discomfort. So, you know, when you when you have an opinion about the world, you don't feel uncomfortable that you don't have all the information. It's just, you feel very, in fact, you feel the opposite. You feel yeah. very confident. And, um, and I think that that's kind of what we're quite good at calling ourselves out. You're like, you just think that because that's your experience. Yeah. Um, it's a great and, point. Um, and you're not you're missing all of this information. It's like often what you bring to me. It's like mm -hmm. you're missing the client's perspective here. You want to increase pricing, but you're missing I'm the client's always perspective. Like, yeah. You want to say this. Yeah, yeah. You're, it's a classic yeah. Dun and Kruger, mm. basically. The Dun -Kruger yeah. Effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when you do it, you know, you do something out of passion, something that's your idea. It's super easy to think from your own perspective as well. Mm. So, and exactly. especially in food related stuff, uh, I've I've also had to learn the, the hard way to. To also put stuff on the menu I don't personally like mm -hmm. but as long as someone else likes it or loves oh. it then you know that that's, needs to work that's the classic chat isn't it Jeannie yeah I mean the sales so with a catering business the kitchen have an idea of like what the customer wants but the sales team actually knows what sells more and they know like what the office manager for that corporate is going to order yeah. re on repeat and so that is definitely a problem we have where sales are like no can we office. just put these on we're going to make way more money in the kitchen are like but I want to try this like yeah. experimental yeah. thing with like a spice that no one knows what it is so won't order and it's just Macro. it's a yeah it's all people in the UK in the office do not eat mackerel okay. for lunch. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, if it is, but our head chef loves mackerel. Well, I was going to yeah. ask, does anyone eat? 
I love macaroni. macaroni. You love it? Yeah, oh, yeah it's good. Big macaroni okay. Eaters. It's I'll got a bit of Eastern European in it. Mine open. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, but you went from the kind of lunch catering company, and and the idea there is you you made uh, the food for the tech companies, and then you cycled it out on your own. You didn't use like secondary delivery services, or no, we actually built our own fleet of cyclists. Yeah. Um, so we've got our own team who and we've got our own bikes. Uh, cargo bikes with the big baskets at the front they can fit like 100 lunches in them each and then we have like a, a cyclist that goes to each section of London so west central and then delivers them out so yeah we ran everything from the cooking and the delivery obviously one of the first companies that were doing it pre-delivery and then now that's so I mean now everyone's doing delivery and grocery delivery yeah. so it's a different market exactly and then you kind of by chance or by by your own own need stumbled across the idea of, of maybe you know or the the fact that it was hard to find kitchens yeah. and and like the investments were heavy and all that kind of stuff related to that and the lead times are long and, and all exactly so we with our catering business really couldn't find kitchen space we end up sharing a restaurant kitchen in Soho we were get growing so quickly we got kicked out of that kitchen because we we're basically taking it over we built our first kitchen which was so expensive for a small business to do and we nearly failed from doing that and then we moved again within three months so we moved three times in one year you can see like as a small business the capital that you have to invest that is just crazy and when we finally stabilized and we took a warehouse in Hackney um we were committing to five year leases and we weren't making enough money to to really commit to five years it was terrifying so we ended up sublet- subletting the space to other people in food we had a rice production in the corner we had a woman who did like catering who took it when we left the space and it basically became this like food ecosystem and it wasn't built to share and we thought wow if you build a space to share like it'd be so cool like you could get so many brands under one roof great things happen and when we kind of stabilized our business then we were like why don't we be the people that do that so that's yeah. what happened I think that in any market there's always big you know there's always barriers to entry and in food and drink um the barriers to entry are very high and the funding is quite hard to come by so if you want to start a restaurant in london it's going to cost you about half a million pounds or maybe even a million and take you about a year to get it up and running and with karma kitchen you can be up and running in two weeks and it costs you ten thousand pounds so you know you're bringing down the barriers to entry so significantly that it's a no you know it's like a simple uh, decision for these businesses to take these risks and we've had businesses who are using our service who've opened 16 sites in the last year you know it's incredible and they don't feel overstretched and they don't even need to raise money to do it which is pretty game-changing I think and you can really see the impact um, in the growth of the businesses that are even in our space alone yeah investors think so too apparently i mean you've raised 100x uh, compared to what you at some point thought you were gonna yeah this is so, one of those stories that is like well, that, okay uh, that, like that, <laughs> like that's, that's a typo a that's a that typo uh, have. Yeah, <laughs> like, is there one zero too much or two yeah. or? a lot of people ask us if it was a, a spelling mistake um yeah. but uh, yeah we were raising the wrong place originally you know we were looking at vc money with, and we were building something that was very capex heavy um we were meeting with so many vcs we had a lot of rejection a lot of people love the idea Um, But they just didn't. Yeah, that's not the way it works. So it was kind of like we had to relook at where we were focusing. And that's when we kind of discovered as people who never raised money before, you know, our first business was revenue driven, that private equity was a really good route for us because it's actually, you know, buying assets and it's more of a, you know, real estate take on it. So it's funny, like now looking back at it, we just didn't have the knowledge of like where to raise money. And now if we went out and did it again, it hopefully wouldn't have taken us as long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. I mean, who can say? No, I'm joking. You just never know. Like, it, it's not easy for us. We, we struggle with fundraising. Like, I know it sounds like a, a good story, but it, it was very hard. And um, even when we kind of got the deal that we wanted, COVID hit and our whole deal collapsed. You know, we'd, we'd paid for the legal work. We had a term sheet and then the money we was meant to be in our sheet. account. All of the legal work for the entire deal yeah. was complete and um, the deal just fell apart, you know, um, right at the very beginning of COVID. Nothing mm. to do with us, just it was the funding, uh, funders yeah. issue. And um, and we had to, yeah, we had to go back out to the three market. Three weeks to get Luckily, deal on the table. Yeah, we had three weeks uh, to do it and we did it, yeah, pretty much in that time. But um, I don't think it's going to get easier either. I think that every fundraise will just bring new problems and issues I yeah think they it, all probably have their own challenges they do they yeah. all have their own challenges i think um you know your network in- increases every deal you do and if i had to say one thing it's like just make a big effort with everyone be patient with everyone and be nice like i know i know that you know being polite and being nice isn't always like the thing that um 
people talk about, but I do think it is important to like respect the fact that people are taking time out of their day to listen to your business and asking you questions to understand it better and um and just to be like you know supportive of that because it can be difficult when you're trying to get to know a business that you don't really understand anything about and you're just asking questions about information you just don't want to end up getting defensive I definitely recognize that myself at certain points like maybe over the last three years and just have worked really hard to just address that be like wait I need to change my my way yeah what was the logic behind buying the warehouses and not just uh, because that instantly turns it way more capital intensive yeah. should I take should I take this one yeah, so basically our sites last for a really long time they last for like 20 30 years and the kind of infrastructure that we're building is built to like really pay back over the long term so a typical lease length in the UK has gone from 20 years to like 10 years to five years um, and the kind of sites that we take are very competitive and the land value is increasing quite a bit and the rents are really going up and there's more and more competition for that kind of space from last mile logistics companies but also from housing developers so they're squeezing everyone's squeezing on a limited pool of space available and that means that your lease when it comes to your exit point you know your leases may only last for another five years and not be renewable and then what will happen you've invested millions of pounds into just the capex and you can't move that stuff yeah. outside so it's kind of the mcdonald's model like yeah. the, the land itself will become more valuable than the business at some point maybe and maybe. at least it'd be a good part of your balance but sheet but also you'll be able to hold the value in the business over the long term so at any point of exit you can m- ensure that you've got 20 30 40 years where Karma Kitchen can operate in that site uninterrupted. We're also investing a lot of capital into these sites and we do have a few leasehold but when you own the freehold you have the freedom to really like spend that money so for example we're building green substations in partnership with another company and if we lease that it probably wouldn't be worth it but because we're owning that site it really is and Eki and I really want to try and build kitchens in a green way it's kind of never been done so it helps us hit those goals if we own the freehold yeah and it's actually a surprisingly easy thing it's an expensive thing to do but it's an easy thing to do where you can basically change if we get to our target of 30 sites the next like what is it three four years um we will be supporting around uh, three, four thousand food businesses um in the uk which is a lot of businesses that's you know that's a lot that's like mm. it's a lot of buying big, power that's a lot of buying firstly yeah it's a lot of buying power when it comes to the way that waste is processed or what kind of packaging those businesses use um or where their power and electricity comes from we can control all of these different levers and really start to pull the biggest ones when it comes to building design and make our spaces you know net zero hopefully by the end of next year we'll have like be well on our way wow. to doing that okay. um, and that means that every business that comes through our space without having to try and think because it's hard to make those decisions when it's just you making this decision the best and you don't thing. feel the effect of it yeah, and the it's best. maybe not the first thing a small business will invest yeah, in restaurant you, know, you, have a big, you have to pay the it's bills not a you have to pay yeah. it's expensive and, stuff, yeah. and you know sustainability is very powerful when you don't have to think about it right so if we're doing all of that if we're choosing the supplies that are coming into the space we're providing the space that is that then it's and we manage all the waste as well so the businesses don't even have to think about recycling or, or they oil throw stuff away. they literally just throw it into a bin and then we sort it so I mean the right bin convenient. obviously <laughs> has to be the right bin <laughs> has to be the right bin don't throw in the wrong bin <laughs> yeah but you will be built no. so um, what about the what about the how do you acquire customers and what's the model there like how do they um, how do they James, why don't you tell yeah. us how you acquire all Very, I mean, <laughs> we don't have marketing that is actually the craziest thing but I was talking about this earlier like someone asked me how much we spend on marketing I was like we really okay. don't spend anything on marketing we have a very direct to business about, like we our sales team just reach out constantly all day and we're selling a solution we so right now it feels like it goes really well you know you're providing a space that's like not that much capital it's great I mean our spaces are beautiful they're all glass they're all bright um, but we basically, I mean, obviously we had a little bit of press recently, which helps build your profile. But for food businesses, they don't really read those papers. So it's very much about getting out and being present at, you know, markets. Connecting, and connecting with the communities that you're going into. You know, you want people in your community to know who you are and mm. like ordering from you. And the most important thing for us is about building a good and trusted relationship within every community we go into so you know people have been to the site they know what it's about they know that we have 
five star. We know where their ratings. food's coming from. Yeah. And I think the the big kind of achievement of that is when our brands post about their food, they tag it's coming from yeah. apartment kitchen. So they're proud of saying where their food, you know, where the restaurant is, if it's Byron or, I think, or whoever. I, and and just yeah, and I think that you know we talk a lot about just get the get the basics right. We're there to do operations and do them well get those things right every single day be consistent about it and of course things go wrong things break it's just how it is you you run restaurants you know if this if you leave something in the kitchen you've got a brand new coffee machine that that will definitely be broken by the end of the week it's just it just is what it is um but you know fix it fix things fast make sure that people know who they can speak to um address all issues quickly and when you're getting the basics right like that you know that's the beginnings of a good marketing campaign i think we did have a conversation about marketing remember the sales team came over and were like guys have you uh have you heard of this thing it's mar- we had a marketing we, maybe we should do some marketing media and, yeah. <laughs> and like, hey, we could do social medias like we could be on all the social media and like it's funny because all of our team is you know especially I'll say some quite young and very up on like yeah. knows everything about it and talks to our clients a lot but it was just such a funny conversation I was just listening to it in the back and I was like yeah, I guess we should do some marketing at some point or another. <laughs> yeah, maybe on the end user side, then because you're clearly building a brand, also even though you're B two B to to see yeah. company, you need to figure out your own brand, as you said, that that people then trust it and wanna wanna even though they don't know the the specific restaurant in your Karma Kitchen setup, they will maybe try it because of Karma Kitchen. So then that brings value also obviously to the restaurants joining you. So. I think we just need to build as much trust as possible around Karma Kitchen and around the kind of services that we offer to the end consumer to our small businesses and also to our large um large multinational cli- kind of clients they need to trust that we have the clout to like deliver a network for them that really works um, and it's the same thing across the board mm. what about finances then you're capex heavy you're also operationally probably front loading quite a lot with building the k- kitchens and, and trying to get everything cash flow positive with the restaurants from the get go maybe some restaurants don't work out as well as expected and, and all that kind of stuff. So how how do you view like finances and manage cash flow and, mm. and so we don't touch any of our um our businesses like revenue line. We no. just they just um they pay us rent and then they can buy into extra services that can also improve their own bottom line. Um but um usually with a with a site um it makes an operating profit just within the first few months that it opens. So um and then it it will take about 19 to 22 months to fully pay back okay. um on the capex invested if you lease the building if you buy the building it's a longer payback yeah. but it, we don't work it out like that we work it out in a more kind of property real estate way on based on freehold yield on cost um and you know our business is fortunately right now like delivering an outstanding freehold yield on cost on most of the sites that we operate even ones where we're really investing heavily in them um and that's because we deliver a good service to our clients um, and we deliver space that is in demand and can offer the kind of network that businesses need to like tap into and use across cities also basically. also space with different people in different food industries you know if you we're not just delivery you know we do corporate catering drinks everything so it means that you're very resilient and when you have like a churn of a restaurant you have more options to replace that you know business with yeah Do you still provide your own like delivery fleet to these kitchens? So or oh, do they just use just for common cans actually? Yes, that but one. the other ones use. We exist, don't get. We don't do that. God, no way yes. are we ever getting involved in that again. No, <laughs> <laughs> I was just about like, to a ask, lot of yeah. people do ask us. I guess so. When are you going to start doing like your own fleet? Honestly, no. running a logistics <laughs> business like that, I don't want to do two. I That's a different animal. Yeah. It's a yeah. completely different piece. I mean, just. I think it's just hard like also with cyclists now I mean the demand you've got so many grocery deliveries you've got all the the aggregators like just deep delivery Walt everyone is looking for cyclists so it's a very different recruitment experience now yeah Uh, speaking on the fundraising thing again a little bit because we've been talking to a lot of VCs and uh, we've spoken about the relationship between VCs and founders um, but from their perspective mostly so what what went into choosing who you chose Um, in your funding rounds and how much of um how much of like assessing personal chemistry was involved there yeah okay. i think um it, it was so funny because yeah. do you remember that woman he was like um a psychic 
you know, she was a psychic for fundraising. Yeah. And, Wait, um, what? Do you remember? <laughs> you told me about that. She's giving you a piece of advice. She wasn't a psychic for fundraising. She was just a, she did she was, tarot. Like, no, but she, she did, did tarot And she read my reading just before we were doing a raise. No, but oh, Jeannie, no. she said that she was, a, like, she focused on, I thought she focused on no, VC she was fundraising. Just general. That would be very neat. Oh, no, because that's what I thought. I <laughs> thought that very she neat. assessed the relationship, the cosmic relationship. Um, before she really, yeah. Yeah. Do you know who I'm talking about now? Okay, I'm sorry, maybe I'm talking about someone else. She assessed. Really the cosmic relationship the and the mystic relationship between um, the fat the you know the founding team and the investor yeah. and works out if they're a good fit yeah. and she once offered us her services. I mean, to be honest, I knew it was that. going to cost us loads of money, so I thought we won't go down that route. <laughs> and, you know, Wait, was I she a consultant that was hired to was, do this? As she was, like a she was a mystic, a consultant, but also a mystic who oh. who's who's strategy. I mean, I would love. There to are so find many that. interesting jobs out there, and um, I think I think it's something that we definitely yeah. didn't really focus on enough at the beginning, and now it's something well, that will be a real focus in, now for us. But that I would chemistry say chemistry is so key because you're it's a marriage, like you know, you're working together so and closely. I, I would say that across the board we've met some excellent investors who have really you know supported us the whole way through and um and it's been really you know our first um one of our investors is uh was a customer our first customer at karma cans so he used to order lunches every day for his whole team and now he is an investor in karma kitchen which is incredible i think the most important thing about your investors is that they have the money to fund your growth and that's really, really important. That is, yeah. <laughs> That's really important. That's right. Do you still um, work mainly with private equity or do you also now, once you've validated the model with PE, do you have some VCs now coming on board for the later series with bigger tickets? Or I think we're definitely open to that. I mean, we de- we don't, we're not looking to raise right now. Yeah. We um, are pretty comfortable with private equity, but for sure, as we expand tech and team, we'll be looking more at the VC route, maybe later on the line. Okay. Um, what, yeah. What about you two? Because you mentioned a few times that you're a bit different, but you work in tandem in this unique way uh, that kind of can be seen just by looking at you kind of interacting. Uh, do you want to, like, uh, what are the differences? What are you like and how do you like? Uh, oh, that's so hard, Jeannie. It's a difficult okay, question I'll, to I'll, look. I'll answer this one. You're quite good at it. Yeah. I'll answer this. I'm good at answering this one. So um, I would say that we work in a kind of strategy and execution style. Yeah. Um, so we will talk um, obviously, and you, it's not like you don't, Im, aren't involved on in the strategy, but like if we have a big new thing to understand and think think through and a new strategy to plan and execute, I'll write up the strategy and we will discuss it internally, but you are responsible for getting shit done, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Eki has, is the incredibly creative in her way of thinking and she comes up with wild ideas sometimes are uh, uh, genius and sometimes i just don't think we can ever execute on them like, no. my job is kind of to be like not, okay not cool this, this is really interesting not at this i like time. it but not right now or yeah this is cool let's execute it and this is how we'll do it so usually that causes a big fight which yes. we argue about yeah for a long we while. find it out like, i'm like i want to open a speed dating and spaghetti making concept restaurant <laughs> where people will fall in love over spaghetti while they make They'll it slurp and on the same date. spaghetti this and their lips will meet like we in actually the- gave this a green light and we actually did do this one i so. want to um, ju- but- build a giant avocado and i want to sell duck wraps from it we, and i want to call it guacamole we did that one did too. That too so um i want to open a restaurant next week and you were like no you have to wait two weeks to yeah. do that so um, it it's a funny relationship we very much yeah Think I think we, but it works. It, it does. Work. It, it yeah. works, and I think you know. So in in the actual business sense of it, you know, I think you do need you do need that balance between the idea and the execution. And execution is like you will not have a business again that when works you're, unless you can execute. When you're hiring, if you just you know don't have a co-founder and you're the big thinker, then you need to remember not to just go with other big thinkers. You need to have executors Conflict. in the Conflict in the, alert. But you just need someone to actually go and make it happen. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And I think, what else? What's a, what other differences do we have? That doesn't mean one. I mean, you're really good at sales. That's a really key thing. We have different skills. Like, I started out in operations, and Jeannie started out in sales. I mean, it kind of... It's great having, so when you start a business, one person in the in the founding team that can sell, because then you'd have to pay someone. And you, you, you're the one that brings all the money in, yeah. so that was definitely helpful. Key core relationships, like, without a sales team, Sales, sales, sales. That's like yeah, the most important thing. For sure. This has been a delight. Of yes, pleasure. I think we have some people yeah, knocking on our cube yeah. door, unfortunately. Go, we thank can go you guys on, so but much. thanks so much yeah, for joining the show. Pleasure meeting you and, and good luck. Yes. And thanks for to the viewers and listeners. See you in the next one. Bye bye. Stay safe, guys. Bye bye.